Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. You know, sometimes when you're playing World of Warships, you end up with a great result, and it's not necessarily because of anything that you did. I just want to make it absolutely clear here that I'm not saying De Bomb 60 here in the British Tier 5 battleship HMS Agincourt does anything wrong in this battle. He, he doesn't really. He ends up in a pretty bad situation fairly early on in this battle and then spends the rest of his time while he's still alive just desperately trying to make the most of it without making it any worse. And the odds are kind of stacked against him as well because, well, the Agincourt is a tier 5 battleship. This is a tier 6 battle. There are four destroyers and two submarines in play and he's going to run into all four of the destroyers and both of the submarines and that's not all. Also, he's in the Agincourt, and the Agincourt's guns, not to put too fine a point on it, while it does have an astonishing number of them, 14, they're only 305mm in calibre. They're basically pea shooters by battleship standards. The armour-piercing shells are garbage. They're not even high enough calibre to overmatch the bows of a lot of the cruisers that this ship is likely to face. And the high explosive shells are not much better. In fact, the only thing good about the high explosive shells is their chance to set a fire on target. The Agincourt does tend to set a lot of fires, but in order to set fires on target with the ship's main battery high explosive shells, she first has to hit what she's shooting at, and the accuracy of these guns is utterly abysmal. I am not, however, saying that the Agincourt is a bad ship. I think she's a pretty good ship, handled correctly. But most of the damage that you do in the Agincourt is probably not going to come from the main battery guns, because they are abysmally bad. The Agincourt does, however, have hilarious secondaries. This ship has the best secondaries of any ship that you're going to see, until at least Tier 7 in certain cases. Ships like the Gneisenau and the Scharnhorst do have pretty good secondaries if you spec for it. And she's also a lot tougher than most Tier 5 battleships which does make her a bit of a brawler. Now you can see the range of the secondaries, 8.3 kilometers. You can also see the abysmal performance of the main battery guns. And I'm not talking about the number of hits. That was actually surprisingly good for the Agincourt. It wasn't bad for any battleship. 14 shots fired at a small, fast-moving destroyer right before it smoked up and went undetected. Four hits. But of those four hits, with the battleship's main battery high explosive shells, he only did 4,000 damage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing good about the Agincourt's main battery guns are that it has 14 of them. In every other respect, they are utterly, utterly terrible. And it is here. Right as the Emil Bertin up ahead is suiciding for no good reason that I can see. It is here where De Bomb gets himself into a little bit of trouble. He's trying to head into the cover of the islands to sweep around the flank over there on the left side of the map. But with a top speed of only 22 knots, the Agincourt is so horribly slow that he's been caught cold in open water before he can get there. And he is now facing both of the enemy submarines, all four of the enemy destroyers. And there are so many potential torpedoes, and some of them not potential, you can see that if he were to try to continue that turn to the left, not only would he be eating a whole bunch of torpedoes, but he'd be given broadside to a whole bunch of unwanted enemy attention, including that Congo over there, the Bayern, and potentially also the Viridus Unitas. And while the Agincourt is a tough ship, his broadside wouldn't survive a paddling of that magnitude, so he's now kind of committed to fighting it out here. I mean, he could attempt to complete the turn to port and get into cover. He might even survive it. But he's decided, screw this. Chicks dig scars and glory lasts forever. Let's go for it. Another terrible 3,000 damage <laughs> from three high explosive penetrations, no less, on the Congo over there. On the bright side, he's not rushing forward to get into an even worse crossfire than he already is and now he's got some targets for his secondaries. Unfortunately, while he does have a lot of secondaries, 
Most of them are 76 mm which can't actually do any damage to anything beyond setting fires, although they're certainly good enough to take out a submarine. There's his first kill. The uh, awful performance of the high explosive main battery guns on the Congo, again. Why isn't he firing on the piercing? He's got the Congo's broadside. Yeah, it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> He'd need to be a lot closer than this to score citadels on a Congo with these 305 mm armor piercing shells. Notice he is actually directing the fire of the secondaries, by the way. These kills are not happening by accident. That's kill number two. He's setting priority targets for the secondary batteries. 14 shots out at the Congo at a range of 7.5 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> five penetrations for what? 5,000 damage? Absolutely terrible. Is the Congo even shooting back at him? If he is, I haven't known. Oh, the Congo's picked up an escort. He's got a T-22 trying to hide behind him. Okay. Secondary's focused on the T-22 for at least half a second. Then he realises that the hill is a much bigger threat, as is the U-69 that just popped up. Secondary's focused on the hill. Probably coming in for a torpedo attack. Doesn't really need to worry about the Congo too much anymore because the Congo is paying so much attention to him he's completely ignoring the New York and the New Mexico that he's about to broadside as he clears the island that he's about to pass. Um, with fatal consequences. Yep, there goes the hill. Secondary is refocused on the T-22. Depth charge attack out on the U-69. There's the hill's torpedoes. There's the double strike on the T-22. The hill does get a fair amount of torpedoes, but they're all horrendously slow and very, very easy to dodge if you have a working brain and are capable of thinking and breathing at the same time. The U-69 is still out there. I didn't see any depth charge hits. I'll tell you what else I didn't see, despite the fact that he has faced both, and is still facing one of, the enemy submarines in this game. No sonar pings. That might be me though. I mean, I don't play submarines because I try not to be part of the problem for the same reason that I don't play aircraft carriers. Um, does the U-69 even get the ability to ping a target to guide torpedoes? Honestly, I don't know. That, that could be just me. You can see that the bomb wants to attempt to turn in to face the U-69, but that would mean giving broadside to the Bayern and the Viribus Unitas who may be waiting for him to do exactly that in order to paddle his broadside. So he judges that the U-69 is going to be the lesser of two evils. Also, he wants to get shots out on the Monte Cajoli over there, because this is surely going to be a kill, right? Wrong. <laughs> and there's the U-69. Credit to the U-69, he did time this one perfectly. He instantly focuses the secondaries on the submarine, kills him, scores the Kraken Unleashed, but not before eating all of the torpedoes. Instantly triggers his damage control, although he's got 30 seconds to wait before he can get a heal off. Focuses the Viribus Unitas with the secondaries. The Monte Caccioli's taking a risk and staying detected in order to get some shots off and sneak that kill. He gets the guns pointing once again at the Monte Caccioli, shots out, nailed by the Viribus Unitas, and that's it. Except it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> because the secondaries finish off the Viribus Unitas and the last second clutch shot from the forward turrets finishes off the Monte Caccioli for sadly only one just a flesh wound award for killing somebody after you yourself had already died but his seventh kill of the game Five close quarters expert awards not a huge surprise when you're in the Agincourt but two, not just one Two double strikes, the Confederate, the Kraken Unleashed, and a couple of other awards that I don't even recognise. <laughs> uh, ending, of course, with the It's Just a Flesh Wound. Honestly, I feel like he should have gotten two, because he did get two kills. It was a double strike right after his ship had been sunk. Now then, team, try not to fuck this up. <laughs> okay, there are six of you. You're facing two enemies. You know where they both are. Where are they, actually? Who else is back here? The Agano, or Agano. I honestly have no idea how to pronounce this. It's one of those new Japanese cruisers. Agano sounds a bit too Italian, really, doesn't it? <laughs> it's probably just Agano. It's not long afterwards when I realise I've made a horrible mistake. I know, big surprise. Do try to contain your shock. Um, as the New York scores another kill by nailing the enemy Algerie. And I'm thinking, that can't be an Algerie. I must have read that wrong. This isn't a Tier 7 battle. No, it is a Tier 7 battle. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes De Bond's achievement even more impressive because he wasn't just mid-tier in this battle. 
He was actually bottom tier. This was a tier seven battle. Of course it was Jingles. How could you not notice that? Well, you know, I'm Jingles. I'm crap. I'm quite famous for it. Um, yeah, yeah, tier five is rough, by the way. I mean, there are some good ships at tier five, but the matchmaking gets really tough. Prior to tier five, everybody has protected matchmaking, right? You'll never face anything more than one tier higher. Then suddenly you reach tier five and boom. Colorados, Sharnhorsts, Fijis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of rough at tier 5. Meanwhile, everybody's saying to the buy-in over there, look, what's the point in prolonging this? You know, we're capping out. Just make a fight of it. And you know what, to the buy-in's credit, there is, this is not an episode of the Game of Thrones, right? There is no way the buy-in's going to win this, he knows it. What's the point in running away? You're just saving pixels for the next battle. Turn around, come back, fight. Go down gloriously. You'll do some more damage, you'll earn some more credits and some more experience. Well, you might not. You might run into a bunch of torpedoes and just die horribly. <laughs> but you might do some more damage, you might get some more credits, you might get some more experience. Something that isn't going to happen if you just run away and hide. So turn around. If you're in this situation, do what the buy earns doing. Make a fight at it. You stand to profit from it, and it just... There's no point in dragging the battle out for everybody else who's chasing after you, trying to kill you. you. You're just... You're not necessarily just being a dick. I think a lot of people who come to World of Warships from World of Tanks don't realise that the repair costs that you pay at the end of a battle are a flat rate. It doesn't matter how many hit points you survive the battle with. There's no point in trying to preserve your pixels for the next battle. Right? It doesn't make any difference financially. You, you still get charged the same logistics and repair cost. So the Bayern's doing the honourable thing. I mean, he knows he's, he's not going to win. He's got no chance of winning, but he might get some more damage off. He might get a cap reset. And to Bomb's team, recognising this, are showering him with plus ones. So even if he isn't going to farm any more damage, he's at least farming a bit of karma. So well done to the Bayern for being a good sport and not dragging it out unnecessarily and uh, giving the New York his third kill of the game. And of course, extremely well done to the Bomb 60. Bottom tier in a tier 7 battle got himself into a fairly precarious situation very early on in the game due to the monstrously slow speed of the ship that he was sailing. Dug his heels in, made the most of it, came out of it with two double strikes, five close quarters experts awards, the Kraken Unleashed, seven kills, and the It's Just a Flesh Wound award. I'll bet he did not see that one coming when he was looking at the team list and realising that he was facing two submarines, four destroyers, and a whole bunch of tier 7s in his crappy little tier 5 HMS Agincourt. That's it for today, folks. Hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.